How do we perceive God when we believe that he is inactive? Or how do we perceive him when we believe him to be absent? Have any of you uh, thought this or maybe even said this out loud? God, do you hear me? What happens when we get in that frame of mind when we are wondering, is God there for us? What we'll find is that's not unique. We can find in the Bible places where others have asked that same question. God, are you there? Or are you absent? We know that God is to be our div divine friend. He's supposed to be somebody that we read the story of in the Bible. And we take time to tell him our story. Isn't it wonderful that God wants to know our story? We grew up, didn't we? We believe that God is perfect, that, that God can answer all of our questions. And then life experiences take place, don't they? And we ask the question of, where is God when suffering takes place? Where is God when evil takes place? Where is God when there's a natural disaster? You know, it's interesting that we don't have to go too far in the Bible to find that Job 24, the groans of the dying rise from the city and the souls of the wounded cry out for help. God's silence angered Job. Job says, who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? Job clearly had some difficult things happen in his life and there were times that he thought God was absent. Lamentations 3, the lamenter here who we believe is Jeremiah says, even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. There's instances in the Bible where God appears to be absent. How about in Mark, when Jesus is on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus may have the thought, God, where are you? Do you hear me? Well, each of us has probably been in that wilderness, has been in that desert where we've asked that question. God, do you hear me? But maybe, maybe God's perceived silence, his perceived inactivity is just him exerting patience in disguise. Our society demands a broadband God. We want a 4G God. We want a God where we ask and we get an immediate answer. We want it to be quick. We want to be able to defrag our relationship so we get it instantly. We want a 4G God, but we don't have that. So any delay, any time frustrates us. We get frustrated because I prayed and he hasn't answered. I, I pray and it's not on my schedule. Well, God doesn't work that way. We know that. And so we even get frustrated though when we get the answer. Because maybe we don't discern it in the right way. Or maybe we get the answer and guess what? We just don't like it. So frustration seeks, steps in. But what do we find? What is a healthy prayer life? Because wouldn't we all like to have that? A healthy prayer life is less about understanding God. Hear this now. Less about understanding God and more about experiencing God. 
our prayer life should be experiencing God. Now, my take on seminary is just the short time I was there. But what I can glean from those that went to seminary in the earlier 20th century, and then those that I know that, I'd say from the 90s now, is seminary changed a bit. And that is, it was very focused early in the 20th century on theology. It was very important that we knew all of the theology and could, and could recite it and knew it and were clear on it. And that's still important. But seminaries today are more about shaping people in the practice of their faith. What do I mean? I'll give you my experience at Asbury because that's the only place I went. From the minute I got there, prayer was paramount. Prayer before class, prayer after class, prayer at 5.30 between your last class in the afternoon and if you had a night class. Opportunities for prayer and practice of prayer were important. Because what Asbury wanted to do, sounds like I'm advertising, but what Asbury wanted to do to the seminarian was shape him or her in the practice of their faith while at the same time grounding them in some theology. And I think that is where we are moving. Now we know that people that are in seminary today, that are in their 20s and 30s, actually seek gaining the practice of it, shaping themselves as the person that God would have them be. Persistence in prayer is common. We find it in Luke 18. I read out of Luke 11, but Luke 18 has an interesting parable that Jesus uses. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray, always pray, and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Widow says, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. We know that we are in God's chosen people. And this widow who continues to press and press Jesus uses that example to the disciples to tell them to be persistent. Just like the friend at midnight who goes over to get the loaves of bread for the friend that was visiting them. We are called to maintain our relationship with God. Leonard Sweet, Leonard Sweet's a, a, an author. Uh, he has a great book called Viral. He also has a great book um, called Learning to Dance the Soul Salsa. Uh, he, he's he's a, a funny a writer. Um, he, says, he says this. His prayer life changed when he removed the comma. Instead of saying, please, God, he learned to say, I want to please God. He took the comma out. So what our, we're called to do in our prayer life is not please God, but to please God. God. Our emphasis should be on that. And when we do that, then our prayer life becomes a celebration of that relationship that we have with our divine friend, enticing God to meet our expectations. In the Native American culture, when a boy is to become a man, 12 or 13 years old, he is sent out into the woods to spend the night alone. So as the boy is out in the woods, in the dark, alone, you know that he is anxious and he's nervous and he probably doesn't sleep. 
And so on this particular night, one of those boys is out to become a man, and he's there, and he is nervous. And he's anxious. And he stays up all night. And as the sun starts to come up in the morning, he sees the figure of a man with his bow and arrow at the ready. And as it becomes clearer, he finds it's his father who has been there all night to protect him. The analogy is the same for us. When we have those dark nights, when we have those dark times in our life, when we have those times that we are anxious and we are nervous and we probably are sleepless, we can know that God is there with us even when we don't see him, we don't perceive him, and we may even have thoughts that he's absent. He is still there. In researching this prayer, prayer with God being absent, I came across a great analogy. It's not mine. I think it's wonderful though. The analogy is that God is like water and we are like the land. We're like the riverbed. And the relationship between God and his people are like the relationship between the water and the riverbed, caressing its banks, redirecting itself as it moves forward. The water helps shape the bed. It gains in texture from the water. God being the water fills the universe, remolding the riverbed as it moves through with a natural flow. It guides, it guides us in a similar way calling us to reshape our lives in accordance, what? To the purpose He has for us. He wants that relationship to be so mutual that we want what He wants. But we put outside materials in the channel, don't we? We redirect the water. We dam it up some places because we have chaos in our lives. And we try to, we try to change where the water goes. That's what the 21st century Christian seems to want to do. We want to direct our life. We don't want to be directed on how God wants our life to go. God is in total with us and all of creation. So we have to turn inward and search for God within our own soul so we can experience God not just learn about God, not just have the knowledge of God, but build that relationship with God. One of the theology classes that I took studied Paul Tillich. I don't know if any of you have heard of Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich, Karl Barth were two of the uh, well-known Christian um, philosophers of the 20th century. Paul Tillich happened to be a German, American Christian existentialist philosopher. That's a lot of words for a guy. But he had something that really uh, helped me. And that is, Paul Tillich believed God was the ground of being. In quotes, the ground of being is how he... Now, how I took that, and how I've used that, and how I've spoken to people, is that if, if God is my ground of being, and I believe he is, I use the word authority. Some people don't like the word authority. Maybe ground of being is softer. But either way, I think they're interchangeable. God is my authority. God is who my bedrock. God is my ground of being. He is where everything starts and stops. And I pray each day that I am never separated from Him. Or that I never feel separated from Him. When I interact with my own chaos that I typically make in my own life. When I'm building a dam or I'm throwing a, a branch or I'm putting something in the way of the water, the natural flow of Christ in my life, I pray that I will get those, remove those, so that I will have a healthy, healthy prayer life, meaning I will be experiencing God, not just knowing of God. Prayer moves us so that we know that God is always present, standing in the midst of our tumultuous life that we can feel Him, and that we can know He's there when we don't quite feel Him, and that we end up having this stream and riverbed experience that would be that gentle yet dynamic relationship. So that we never have those thoughts that seem to creep in at times, God, do you hear me? 
but instead, because of our experience, it's, God, I know you hear me, and I know you will react. Prepare me to receive what it is you want me to do, where you want me to go, how you want me to act, what you want me to say, when you want to keep my mouth shut. Help me to do, do everything that you want for my life. I want to be the ground for your being. I want you to be my authority. I want to be persistent in my prayer. I want it to flow naturally. I want my soul to encounter you, God. I want my soul to encounter you daily, many times during the day. I want my soul to be able to encounter others so that they see God in me. That's who I want to be. God, help me be that person. Keep me entwined with you. Keep me directly with you at all times. Don't allow me to separate myself. Don't allow me to put things in the water to prevent the stream of your love and your care from washing over me. God, I want to celebrate my relationship with you. And I want others to celebrate with me their relationship. That we can celebrate as a community of faith the relationship we have with God who is ever present with us in the wonderful times of life and also in those dark, nervous, anxious, sleepless nights. God, celebrate. Celebrate, God, with me. Help me celebrate with you. The ground of our being, the hope of our future, we can find in our God. God, do you hear me? And he's up there saying, Chuck, I hear you all the time. I'm always listening to you. And you know what else? I'm listening to all of those people that you speak to on Sundays. And I'm listening to those people that come on Wednesday morning and pray. And I'm listening to those people on Wednesday night that take time out to be bold and try something new. I am always listening. I am always there even when you think I'm not. I am just practicing my patience. Be patient with me because I love you more than anything. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you for these times that we can just allow you to wash over us, that we can just take time in our alone time to feel your presence, to experience you, Lord. We ask it today. Somebody here would experience you in a new and exciting way. Amen. Our final hymn is number five.